OK, so we're going to have a look at some fun proofs that the square root of 2 is irrational using different bases. We'll start off with a nice one in base 3. So what we need to do is assume for a contradiction that the square root of 2 is rational. So we can write it as a fraction with some integers. And then what's interesting about base 3 is there's only so many options for what our digits can be. They can just be 0, 1, or 2. And what we're going to do is we'll focus on the last non-zero digit. of numbers written in base 3. So for a and b, these are just integers, and your last non-zero digit here, we start off, we don't care what these digits are, it can be either 1, potentially followed by some zeros, or it can be 2, again, potentially followed by some zeros. So the last non-zero digit of a or b is 1 or 2. That's not very profound, but when we square this, a squared or b squared, the last non-zero digit now of a square number well, if it was 1, then 1 squared gives us 1, and we don't care what happens with these zeros. So in the first case, if the last non-zero digit of our integer was 1, the last non-zero digit of our number squared is still going to be 1. But then if we had 2 as our last non-zero digit, now in base 3, when we do 2 squared, we get 4, which actually still gives us a 1, then we add an extra 1 to the previous columns that we don't care about. So what's really interesting in base 3 is the last non-zero digit of a square number has to always be 1. Okay, so how can we use this to find a contradiction? Well, remember that root 2 equals a over b. This rearranges to give 2b squared is equal to a squared. Okay, so we know that the last non-zero digit of a squared has to be 1. So now let's think about the last non-zero digit of 2b squared. So this is we take a number b squared, whose last non-zero digit is 1, multiply it by 2, so you have 2 times all of this, the 1 potentially followed by some zeros. All that happens here is this 1 gets turned into a 2, and then we don't care what happens to all of these digits before, and these zeros remain the same. So 2 times a square number, the last non-zero digit of this, it turns out has to actually be 2. So this is really interesting now, because 2b squared is supposed to be equal to a squared, but 2b squared, the last non-zero digit of this number, has to be 2 when we write it in base 3, whereas the last non-zero digit of a squared, when we write this in base 3, has to be 1. And this is a contradiction, and this contradicts our assumption that the square root of 2 is rational, and therefore we've shown that root 2 is irrational. And this sort of argument can actually be used in different bases as well as base 3. I think it's particularly elegant in base 3, but we'll have a look how this sort of thing looks in base 10. So we look at the last non-zero digit of an integer a or b in base 10. This is just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Then the last non-zero digit of these numbers squared then, so the last non-zero digit of a squared or b squared, this will be 1, 4, 9, 4 squared gives us 16, which gives us a 6, 5 squared gives us a 5, and 6, 9, 4, and 1. So all of our possibilities are 1, 4, 5, 6, or 9 for the last non-zero digit of a square number. Then this gets interesting again when we look at the last non-zero digit of 2b squared. So you could get a 2, or we could get an 8, so 2 times 9 gives us 18, which gives us an 8, 2 times 6 gives us... 12, which gives us a 2. 2 times 5 actually gives us a 0, which is no good, because this is supposed to be our last non-zero digit. And similarly, we get 2, 8, 8, and 2. So the last non-zero digit of 2b squared, this has got to be either 2 or 8. But 2b squared, once again, this is supposed to be equal to a squared, and the last non-zero digit of a squared has to be equal to 1, 4, 5, 6, or 9. And you can see there's no overlap between these two sets of numbers. So this is a contradiction once again. The last non-zero digit of 2b squared has to be 2 or 8. This is supposed to be equal to a squared, but the last non-zero digit of a squared can't be equal to 2 or 8. So once again, we've shown by contradiction that root 2 is irrational. So now we're going to go back to base 3 for a slightly different proof. So here we're going to add the assumption not only is root 2 a rational number, but we're also assuming that we've expressed it here with a and b as small as possible. So we're assuming that we've written it as a simplified fraction with integers. And what we're going to do is instead of looking at the last non-zero digit of a and b, we'll look at the last digit of these when we write them in base 3. So the last digit of any integer in base 3, so for a and b, our last digit can be 0, 1, or 2. 
And then let's have a look at the last digit of a squared or b squared, it's the square of an integer. If our integer ended in 0 and we square it, this is going to give us a 0 at the end. If we ended in 1 to begin with and we square this, 1 times 1 still gives us a 1. And then if our integer ended in 2 and we squared it, we would get 2 squared is 4, but actually this is going to end in a 1 in base 3 because we carry that 3 over into the previous column. So the only possibilities for our last digit of a square number in base 3 are 0 or 1. Now let's have a look at 2 times a square number for the last digit of 2b squared. So here, if we do 2 times something ending in 0, this is still going to end in 0. Or if we do 2 times something ending in 1, this is now going to end in 2. Okay, so how do we get a contradiction here? So once again, we're using the fact that 2b squared is supposed to be equal to a squared when we rearrange this equation here. We know that 2b squared has to end in a 0 or a 2, and we know that a squared has to end in a 0 or a 1. So the only possibility is that both of these end in a zero. But this is actually a problem because if you think in base three, if a number ends in zero, this means that your number is divisible by three, just like how in base 10, if a number ends in zero, it's divisible by 10. And this actually contradicts our minimality of a and b. So we were supposed to have these as small as possible, but the fact that 2b squared is divisible by three, the fact that a squared is divisible by three, this tells us that a and b actually both have to be divisible by 3. So once again we've got a contradiction here. This contradicts the fact that a and b are as small as possible because we could divide both of these by 3 and get something even smaller. Therefore the root 2 is irrational. And once again we can try this sort of argument in different bases. So we'll have a look at how this looks in base 10. So you know that a square number in base 10, so our a squared or b squared, the final digit of this can be either 0, 1, 4, 5, 6, or 9. Then if we have a look at the very last digit of 2b squared, we can either do 2 times 0 is 0, or we can do 2 times 1 get 2, or we can have 8. 2 times 5 gets us 0 again, we can get 2 or 8. So the only possibilities for the last digit of 2b squared are 0, 2 or 8, but we know that 2b squared is supposed to be equal to a squared. So this tells us because the only overlap between these two lists is 0, a squared has to end in a 0 and 2b squared also has to end in a 0. But this tells us that 2b squared is a multiple of 10. It also tells us that a squared is a multiple of 10. And once again, this contradicts our assumption that a and b are chosen to be as small as possible. So you can show that a and b both have to be multiples of 10, or at least you can show that they both have to be multiples of 5 immediately. And this once again contradicts our assumption then that the square root of 2 is rational. Now we'll finish off just by looking at a variant of this proof in base 2. So unfortunately our first proof where we look at the last non-zero digit doesn't really work in base 2 because the last non-zero digit of any number is going to be 1 in base 2 unless that number is 0. However, if we look at the last two digits of our number in base 2, we know that any integer, the only options for our last two digits are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So then let's have a look at the last two digits of a squared or b squared. So we have something that ends in 0, 0 and we square it. This is still going to end 0, 0. If you have something that ends 0, 1 and we square this, it's still going to end 0, 1. If we've got something that ends 1, 0 and we square this, this is now going to end with two zeros. And finally, the last one to check is a number that ends in 1, 1. If we square this, you can show that this ends in 0, 1. So the only possibilities for the last two digits of a squared or b squared when we write these in base 2 are 0, 0 or 0, 1. So now let's have a look at 2 times b squared, which now that we're working in base 2, I really ought to write this as 1, 0 times b squared. But the last two digits here of 2b squared, they're either going to be 0, 0 again when we multiply this by 2, or if we multiply 0, 1, something that ends in 0, 1 by 2, we're going to get something that ends in 1, 0, you can check. So these are our only two possibilities. And once again, we know that 2b squared, or 1, 0 times b squared, this has to be equal to a squared. So this tells us that both of these have to end in 0, 0. This is really interesting now, because if a number ends 0, 0 when it's written in base 2, this is basically telling you that your integer is a multiple of 4. So this tells us that 2b squared is a multiple of 4. It also tells us that a squared is a multiple of 4. Then this implies that a and b both have to be multiples of 2, which means we can simplify our fraction further. And once again, this contradicts our assumption that a and b are minimal. I think this is a really interesting one because this is basically just a different take on the classic proof 
where we rearrange, and once again you show that A and B both have to be multiples of 2.